very much uh, for the, the comments yeah. earlier. My name is Carol Nuga de Niue, I'm Chair of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation in the Department. And this particular session, uh, this panel that is, uh, speaks to sort of the impact of COVID-19 on the sector and some of the other research that's happening um, in African languages. It's like language is political at the end of the day and, and literacy is, is, is extremely political in South Africa. So I think that's something that we should acknowledge up front. Um, professor, um, the, professor, the two professors, first professor particularly spoke about how, how important it is, not just for academics, but also for other types of engagement. And you could see that in the presentation um, that we've just listened to. So that's the first thing. Um, we are also going to be looking a lot about uh, at sort of the policy context, but also the policy processes and what happens within classrooms, not just as learning losses, but also looking at how instruction itself has to change and the nature of teaching has to change um, in order to accommodate what's happened, the shocks that have, have, have uh, unfolded. Uh, in society, but also within the education system. So it's extremely important to do that. I'm going to ask, uh, my Mpumi is going to start first, um, and then we'll have an input uh, from Martin. Mpumi is going to talk about context, um, and then from Martin, he's going to talk about uh, uh, enrollment, dropout, and other dynamics in terms of processes within, within the system. Um, and then Kali will speak to learning losses, and quantifying and estimation, the best estimations of those learning losses, especially in, in, in African languages. So we're going to be reflecting, if you like, on data um, and information from the, the system. This obviously is data that looks at system performance and what the national education responsibilities are for monitoring that. It supplements what's happening in provinces. It supplements what's happening in higher ed institutions. It supplements what's happening in unions and the NGO sector, as well as in programs. I need to speak up a little bit. Okay, sorry. Um, and it also supplements what's happening in, in as, as, as the professor mentioned earlier. So it's, it's really looking at some data and information that's generalizable to the system, um, in addition to the other, other research that we have. Um, to, to try to make sense of what's happening in, in the sector and in, in relation to literacy. Um, I'm going to try to... Hmm. Okay, I'll just speak from my slides. I don't think this one is... Is okay? Oh, yes, there we are. So, Mpumi... So, Mpumi uh, Martin and Kelly will be reflecting on different data sets. Um, and now some of you know these data sets, um, but others not so much. So I'm going to, we're going to be looking at information uh, drawn from the panel study, which is a national income dynamics study, which is a national asset, a data asset um, that's been going between 20, 2008 and 2017. Uh, it's been used, it's, it's really a sample of uh, individuals and their descendants interviewed over a period of time, um, over, over, over a few, quite, quite a few years. Um, growing from that sample then, the, during the, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, there's the also work that's been done on data collected telephonically from over 7,000 individuals uh, interviewed over five waves of data collection in all 11 languages. So uh, questions on, as Mpumi mentioned uh, sometime in, in, in earlier presentations on demographics, migration, uh, employment, income, nutrition, et cetera. And she'll be referring a lot to that in her presentation. There's also administrative data next. Slide administrative data from South African education administration system, um, as well as uh, data-driven dashboards, which is basically a visualization tool for provincial data uh, that's held by the department. There's personal data, which is personnel administration data, also work that uh, Martin has been doing a lot on focusing on teachers, and some of that was presented yesterday in, in the input from uh, the 
the reading plan. We also have work that's been done on early grade reading studies in African languages uh, using a randomized control, the, the results from randomized control trials uh, in quintile one to three schools using myth, mixed methods on different aspects of literacy, both in EFAL and uh, home language. So really uh, those two uh, 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 studies, early grade reading studies we will be reflecting on. So the panel, I'm going to hand over very quickly now to, to, uh, to Ngumi to take us through the presentation. Um, good morning. I'm going to stand on the side so you can see um, the slides. Um, I'll be presenting, as Carol has mentioned, on the contextual aspects um, of the impact of COVID-19. So this is beyond the classroom. Uh, what happened in society? What happened among teachers? Um, and then the next presenters will give us a more focused presentation on the classroom and learning losses. I'll cover school readiness, what happened to school meals, um, school infections, as well as parent concern. Um, and as Carol has mentioned, um, we're drawing data from all the studies that she has already referred to. And so I won't specify which survey I'm drawing data from as I present. I think it is important to recognize in terms of the context of COVID that firstly, school closure and reopening was highly contested. There were several open letters about whether we should abandon the year, whether we're putting children at risk, when we should go back to school, that we shouldn't go back to school. And this didn't just stop in open letters that were found um, in various media platforms. This ended up with court cases around when we should open or not. And so I think it's important to remember that it wasn't as though it was a time of our uh, complete unification and agreement on how exactly we should be tackling our response to the pandemic. A second aspect to remember was that it was a time of instability. And what we mean about that is, I'm sure you all remember the first time lockdown was happening and I think we're in level five. I think we were told it's two weeks. Um, mm -hmm. uh, some of you left your computers at work. Um, good luck with how that worked out. Um, but those kinds of disruptions, timeframes that were constantly changing, very constantly changing, responsible together, um, how to address, uh, means that it was a time of instability and long-term planning, as in planning for the next term, was a, a, a hard task uh, to accomplish. And part of the efforts by the DBE, I think in summary, were a lot of national regulations, obviously following the National Command Council and all those um, forums that were set up um, at a national level. There's also multi-stakeholder engagement. I think the Secretariat responsible for ministerial and director general um, consultations had said they, by June, had done what they do in a year in terms of meetings that they were holding. So meetings on meetings on meetings in terms of consulting. Um, and then the public discourse about what should be done. And then finally, lots of revisions um, in terms of the calendar. I think the calendar must have been published at least three times in one year. And negotiations with unions about when teachers should return, if they're at extra risk, and how exactly that should be um, addressed. So that, I think, is the large category of what the DBE focused on. In terms of schools, their large focus was complying with standard operating procedures, and again, there was never just one version. There were these um, updated versions as we learned and got feedback um, on what was working well and not working well in schools. Um, looking at DBE um, monitoring data in terms of school readiness, we saw um, fairly high numbers in terms of schools that were ready to reopen. This is based on data collected in July 2020. Um, we saw about 80% of quintile one schools being ready and up to 94% of quintile five schools being ready. Uh, then thinking a bit more about that school readiness and what it meant, uh, you're seeing here the various categories of readiness, facilities, water, um, some nutrition, curriculum, et cetera. And what's striking is everything that's above 90 is orientation to COVID-19 protocols, compliance to protocols, and interestingly, curriculum. I think in terms of curriculum, this was a sense of 
teachers know what they should do in terms of there's a document that they'll need to follow when they get to schools, how well that was actually implemented, how well they were trained on that, I think is a separate matter to what we're measuring here in terms of school readiness. Moving on to school meals, um, while school meals were high here in terms of nutrition, 83% readiness, um, we know that um, we had some challenges with that. So for those who don't know about the school nutrition program, it's one of the um, long-standing strategic safety nets that's been implemented in the education sector. There are over 10, um, not 10,000, I'm sure, uh, 10 million children that are receiving uh, a meal daily. And that's about 82% of learners that receive this meal. What happened during COVID though, is that there was a landmark court case um, around feeding. And this was around the extended time of absence. So when we were initially closing for the two weeks or four weeks, that was um, good in terms of the normal break that children would not have been receiving meals in. But when that time was extended, there was then a court case. The court ruled um, that we had a constitutional duty to provide meals daily, whether children were in school or learning remotely, and that feeding was an issue of social justice and not a supplementary responsibility of the DBE as it had been un understood until then. When we asked children, or when we looked at survey data around access to meals, uh, looking at pre-COVID access, at least once a week, in this time, we asked them about receiving a meal in a two-week cycle, and this number had declined to about 56%. Um, and even looking at DPE reports on the number of children receiving meals, during the pandemic, there were about 1.5 million learners that were not receiving the meal that they would ordinarily have been receiving. And this number in terms of school meals um, varied drastically, depending on how much of schooling was open, when, school, when the phase reopening was introduced in July, only 26% of children were receiving meals. But by the end of the survey in April um, 2021, 56% of children were receiving meals. This means we had not yet recovered pre-pandemic times, um, and there were several court case reports that were like this. When we try and think about school infections and what we know about that, um, we know from literature that no reported learner cases in a school don't mean that infections are not occurring in school, but similarly reported learner cases um, in school do not mean that fewer infections would have been happening if children were not in school. And a review of existing literature found that there's no significant positive or negative effect um, that comes from being in school in terms of infections. And so put differently, school closures are not the best method um, to, pro to, um, to stop infections in terms of non-pharmaceutical interventions. South African data show the same. When we think about teacher infections, oh, cool. next, next, next. When we think of teacher infections, um, this is using Purcell data uh, and it's showing you the number of teachers who were dying before the pandemic and who died during the pandemic. On average, about five teachers um, die in general on a, in any given day. This increased um, to about 407 um, additional deaths to 407 during the pandemic. Um, compared to 236 before the pandemic. Um, and this is calculated as access deaths. So this is deaths over and above what would have been normal. And I think a big point to see here, you can't see it very clearly, is the peaks in terms of the number of teachers um, that had died during the pandemic aligned to the peaks in the COVID-19 waves. And it did not in fact align to when schools were open and when schools were closed. If you look at that second peak, uh, which is the highest tier that happened between December and January when there was no schooling at all. And so the chances that infections were in fact happening at school um, are not true in this case. And then finally, when we think about what parents were saying, how worried were parents um, about the return of their children to school? 
We asked parents, how worried are you about learners in your household returning to school during the COVID-19 pandemic? And overall worry went from 94% in July 2020 to about 45% in April. But what's significant to see here is that worry differed by wealth. Um, the bottom um, deciles were the most worried um, and they were three times more worried than the wealthiest 10%. And I think a story to take away there is all data largely um, has underlying inequalities that we need to be thinking about as we think of how to respond to contextual um, issues when we think about COVID-19. Thanks. I believe I have 10 minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, morning, morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I said a little prayer just now that we don't have further either hacks from unknown people or um, because that happened earlier and or 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 um, load shedding. So, um, so I'm 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 I'm. I'm I'm in Pretoria and unfortunately I couldn't stay in Stellenbosch for the additional day. Um, so let me then follow up um, from Pumi's presentation, talk about these things. Now, this is not directly about reading, but it's of course very important for reading. Um, contact time is essential for learning to happen. And we know that the key reason why uh, we have had these learning losses. It's not the only reason, but certainly the key reason is just lack of regular contact time in schools. And I think what, what is also important about my presentation is that it kind of, it, it, it kind of compares the gravity of the participation problem to the gravity of the learning losses problem, because if one is going to tackle problems, we need to have a sense of how big each of these problems are. And in this regard, there have been some changes in how we understand uh, losses in contact time and in particular dropping out. So um, these are the, the, the kind of take home figures from uh, work that I've done recently. The report is not published yet by the DBE. This is work for the DBE. There's a previous report that is online and it's about enrollments. What I'm going to speak to now largely draws from a more recent report that looks at attendance. So what are the key things that uh, have resulted uh, from this catastrophic pandemic? Um, enrollment losses. So in that enrollment report that I referred to, um, if you compare uh, quarter one enrollments in 2021 to quarter one enrollments in 2020, um, just before the pandemic started, and use several assumptions around things like child mortality, we have about 50,000, we had 50,000 fewer learners in the system than we would have without the pandemic at the beginning of 2021. Now, that might sound odd to those of you who've seen the NIDS CRAM report, because the NIDS CRAM report from uh, based on April 2021 data essentially said that we lost about half a million learners disengaged completely. Um, it seems that is not correct, and I'll speak to that a bit later. So we have a problem, but it's not 500,000, it's about 50,000 uh, in terms of dropping out. Uh, between these two school years. Then attendance. Now, we, we know that in uh, 2020, and this has been quoted in, in num a number of places, uh, about 54% of contact time was lost due to closures and rotations. A number of people have done this calculation. It's quite easy. You just look at the what happened to the, uh, to the calendar for the year. Then what I've also done uh, is look at uh, detailed attendance data 
focusing on the second half of 2021. And there, there we find that about 22% of the contact time one should ideally have in a non-pandemic situation was lost. So almost a quarter of contact time lost even quite recently, the second half of 2021. Um, but this 22% hides enormous inequalities. So that's one of the challenges we face in dealing with the learning losses. These learning losses must be very different across schools, depending on how they did or did not do rotational timetabling. Um, dropping out. So one of the big concerns, and it's always, even before the pandemic, it's, it's always been a big political uh, uh, concern, is youths dropping out before they complete matric. And um, we know that before the pandemic, around 45% of youths were not obtaining the matric, the NSC. Um, now, the surprising thing is that that situation has actually improved during the pandemic because we had an incredible bumper crop of matrics in 2021. The numbers went up spectacularly. Um, and we're still try, trying to kind of understand exactly, you know, what, what contributed to that. It seems the way learners moved through from grade 11 to grade 12, with a lot of older learners from grade 11 moving through, who may usually have dropped out, that seems to have been a large factor. But this is something that, 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 that is still being examined. So the kind of area where many would say, this is the problem we are going to experience, that's actually not the area we found big problems in. Dropping out in, certainly in the upper secondary level has not been the problem that we expected. And then learning losses, well, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to uh, impinge on, 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 on Kelly's presentation, but uh, there, there, there you have it at the bottom. So um, the, so that those were the, the key statistics. I'm, I'm, I'm going to move fairly fast through the rest, just stopping where I think I should uh, for this particular audience. Um, so yeah, where, how do we know about attendance at schools? Uh, we know um, about this from, um, from, from, from systems that, that collect data at the school level, a system called SA SAMS, it's fed through the system, a lot of effort in schools, a lot of management time, which could perhaps be used for curriculum management and learning management is used for this type of work, feeding daily attendance data into the system. Unfortunately, and this is common in, across many developing countries, these data, then sit in these warehouses and they are hardly used. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. So, so what this, um, yeah, this is about some of the problems around linking learners across, across years. Um, and here you see the, um, the trend for secondary level uh, birth cohorts. So this is what surprised everyone, including myself. Uh, so where in 2021, um, we, we had, um, right now, okay, let me get back to this, this graph, um, the, Yeah. Um, so dropping out among uh, compulsory aged learners, um, we, we have some evidence of this uh, after we take into account mortality. The dropping out of, comp of younger learners um, is about 19,000. The 50,000 fewer enrollments at the start of 2021 is in part um, explained by the 
fact that about 27,000 learners have not entered the system in grade R and grade one as we would expect them to. And this is, this is very pertinent to um, early grade reading. So what, is, what, what, what we can expect is a problem of children moving into grades R and one later than anticipated. Now, some of this is, is problematic from a policy perspective, some, some is not. Uh, parents have some flexibility regarding when they take their children to school for the first time. And so this is not necessarily kind of a violation of the South African Schools Act, but it certainly is going to affect the way learning happens. So we are having delays in some children entering school. And here we see where this problem is concentrated. So uh, several parts of Eastern Cape, very serious in Northern Cape and, and, and some of the uh, KwaZulu-Natal uh, coast. Um, and if we look at, um, okay, I've actually run out of time, but if we look at enrollment, sorry, at, at attendance, this is the kind of trend we see. We saw this is the catastrophe of, of the uh, pandemic, 2020, court, uh, term two, term three, et cetera. Um, and here we see before the pandemic, on average, about 3% of contact time was being lost. And this is the, lev the, 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 the level of absenteeism we see in the schooling system. Um, if you look at the data at face value, we were losing uh, in 2021, term three, about 10% of time. The problem is that schools are, in many cases, not entering the data correctly for two reasons. In around about 10% of schools, they report there's no absenteeism at all. Now that is virtually impossible for there not to be a single learner absent in the entire school for a whole term they are simply not entering the data as they should. The second and much larger problem was the fact that many schools did not report rotations. So alternating days of attendance uh, were not entered into the system, although the system was changed in order to accommodate this. Now, one can to some extent see to what extent this is happening, even if schools haven't entered it, because one can look at attendance on uh, regular school days and, 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 and look at the patterns in that. And once, once you take that into account, it's about 22% of time lost at this point in, in 2021, term three, but for about a third of learners, and this is here I'm referring specifically to grade three learners, for about a third of these learners nationally, about 50% of time was lost because they continued with rotations. Rotations were generally 50% of time lost. There were very, very few schools that had children attending say every third day. So at rotation essentially means half of the time lost. And this is the, um, so what, what we've also done is compare the enrollments data to the attendance data, checking learners who have attended at least one day in the second half of 2021. And what we find is that um, if we compare enrollments to attendance, we see that in grade three the, and grade six, there's virtually no difference. So it, and again, if we compare back to 2021 enrollments, we also don't see a major loss. So essentially, this is telling us that at, at, at the primary level, we have not lost a lot of learners in terms of their disengaging completely from the schooling system. Learners have lost a lot of contact time, but the learners still have a relationship with the school. In grade nine, the situation is a little bit more prob problematic with, with uh, um, attendance being about 1% lower than the enrollment. And then NITS cram um, a very valuable source, obviously. Um, I, I, we, I've spoken to people who, who worked on this data, including Pumi, and what we suspect happened is that 
telephonic responses to this question, are there any learners in your household who've not yet returned to school this year, was probably not very well interpreted. Um, given the, the context of rotational learners, learners perhaps being out of school for an entire week. Um, so we suspect that many respondents understood this to mean, are there learners who've not returned to normal school attendance this year? In any event, this is quite a difficult survey to administer. It's, it's over, the, over the phone. And uh, fortunately, it seems as if we have not lost the 500,000 that we thought we had. Sorry, I've gone a little over the time. Thank you very much. Yeah. So um, I'm going to follow on from um, what Martin was sketching out around closures, rotational timetabling, general um, absenteeism, and focus on how these losses in schooling time have translated into actual learning losses. Um, and just to be clear that when we talk, we're mostly talking about the impact of lost schooling days on learning time, but we're taking into account, obviously, it's everything. It's the hunger and the psychosocial concerns, et cetera, that are all feeding. We can't separate those things out. But um, so what I'm going to share with you is some empirical evidence on what we see, particularly on early grade reading in South Africa, on losses related to um, COVID. Uh, related school closures. So um, uh, initially, a lot of the uh, evidence on schooling losses had to use sort of modeling based on previous school closures from things like strikes, the natural disasters and stuff. So uh, South Africa was actually one of the first um, low and middle income countries that actually put actual um, empirical evidence of actual learning losses on the table. Um, to be able to do that, to be able to say what is the impact of the pandemic on learning, we need to be able to measure learner outcomes during COVID in the period of, of school closures. And then we need to have some credible counterfactual to compare that against. We need to be able to say, well, what would those learners' outcomes have looked like in the absence of COVID? And we are very fortunate to have um, data, a, whole, a number of mostly early grade reading studies that were collecting data in the period of both pre-COVID and enduring COVID. Um, so in 2020, we were able to quantify losses in 2020 using three longitudinal studies on Nguni language early grade reading and some um, English first additional language in three provinces. Um, that longitudinal data uh, allows us to um, look at learning gains and not just compare average groups, but we've got actual learning gains of individual learners. So very powerful analysis. And what did we actually find? So um, as Martin said, a huge amount of variation be between schools and also between grades of how much schooling was lost. So in the grade twos in the Eastern Cape and grade fours in Mpumalanga, we're looking at 60 to 66% of the school year being lost. And as a summary, what we find is that 57 to 70% of learning was lost in the grade two year and 62 to 81% lost um, in the grade four year. So that implies a loss of ratio of uh, lost learning to lost school days between around 1 and 1.4. So if we think of learning loss, there's sort of two parts. There's an the opportunity cost of not being in school, but then there's also, particularly for these prolonged losses, you can think of deterioration of knowledge, forgetting over time. Um, so uh, just going to take you through a, a little bit um, through the data and a little bit more of the findings behind those numbers, those percentages. So the first study we used was a Funda Wanda study in the Eastern Cape. And because we had two cohorts of learners, we could compare gains in grade two, in, uh, gains in grade two in 2020 against in the very same schools, gains in grade two um, in 2020, 2019. So this is a really good counterfactual because we've got no real reason why would learners in the same schools one year apart have done differently. Um, if it wasn't for COVID. Um, so here's showing um, 
for the, uh, the development of later sounds for, um, in grade one in 2019. And what we can do with our data is um, using the grade twos in 2019, we can track out what we expected those learners to do in 2020 if there had been no COVID. And then we can measure them and we can see what did they actually do? And you see this dramatic flattening of the learning trajectory. Those are uh, the learning losses. For grade four, um, we were comparing the early grade reading study, the second early grade reading study in Mpumalanga to data from the story powered schools. Um, so here the schools are not the same schools, but if we look at the characteristics of the learners and the children at baseline, very similar. And we can use matching techniques to try and make the comparison um, tight. So just to show you on the left, you've already seen that that's for Fundawanda. If we look to the right here, um, comparing EGRS2 um, with SPS, sorry, I'm doing this. What you can see there is everything sort of looking, the trajectories all look very similar and parallel, but then you see the red piece, that's the COVID bit, and you see this dramatic flattening of learning happening. So we all know that uh, things didn't end in 2020, continued to have this devastating impact, um, rotational timetabling continued and so on. So we now have new evidence that from the second EGR, no, from the first EGRS study in Northwest, that can now say, well, what, if, what happens over not just 2020, but 2020 and 2021 together? And we find in this, in this data set in Northwest, in addition to all the days lost in 2020, 37% of school days lost in 2021, and translates to these enormous losses of between 100, around 130% 100, in home language and around the 50% mark in English first additional language. Put differently, the average 10 year old in 2021 knows less in terms of home language reading than the average nine-year-old in 2018 before the, the pandemic. So just to share a little bit more um, that data too. So EGRS, the data had um, the original cohort following from grade one to grade seven, and then a, two separate grade three samples, and then a new cohort in 21, 2018 of grade fours. And so you can see we've got this post um, COVID period. And so what we can do we can compare um, grade fours in 2020 and compare the performance to grade threes and fours before the pandemic. And we can also compare grade three and four in 2018. So we can actually quantify or well, normally how much do we learn between grade three and grade four. Um, we did a very detailed text comparison and all our comparisons are based on things that use exactly the same assessments or almost exactly the same. What we have here is the Setswana home language um, uh, thing. The, the blue bars are the, where the grade threes are. So grade three in 2018 was reading about 26 words a minute in isolated text. And then the red shows you the grade four. And it's really striking. These learners are a whole nother year in school and they're actually behind where the grade threes were. Um, 1.4 words less on isolated text reading with an additional year of school, remember, and 3.4 words less on reading a passage of connected text. Um, and I've already said this is, this is about 130% of a, a year of learning loss. EFL, um, again, the blue is grade 3, 2018, the red is grade 4s in 2021. A little bit of progress, but let's compare them to the grade 4s in 2018, I don't think this thing is working, but anyway, so that would be comparing the red to the green, and you can see that they are substantially behind, and it's about 5.4 words on word reading and on connected text, about 7.5 words, and these are losses of around 50%. So we think why the losses are less in EFL is if we think on home language, that is reflecting the loss fully through the two years. Whereas with EFL, we, we suspect that a lot of the learning of EFL really kicks in in grade four. And so the loss through grade four and three on EFL 
it's slightly smaller because most of it's coming from from grade four. Thanks very much to the three panelists. I don't know whether Martin can still hear. Um, so what, what does this mean? What are the implications then um, for research? What do we do in terms of literacy um, in, 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 the, in the system? And um, I have some questions. Is this information impacting the catch-up plan for curricula over the next bit? And then I wanted to ask if Martin would be keen to share his slides with us, please. Is Martin actually on? Can we get us yes. on? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Okay. So yes, please, please. I mean, it, yeah. absolutely. This is the department data um, that we are sharing with you um, here. So absolutely, it's fed into the colleagues uh, that are doing the catch-up plan, the the school rebooting plan. Penny. Thank you. Chair, and thank you for wonderful presentations. Um, exciting. Question to the panel, do you see any opportunities that have arisen? Um, as a citizen, for the first time, we've seen this incredible emphasis on why daily attendance and daily reading and writing activities are important. Is, are there opportunities? And are there any risks? Uh, I was teaching in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, and it took us a long time after extended periods out of school for us to get back the energy and rhythm of uh, do they expect any kickback resistance from teachers who have worked very hard but haven't been to school and haven't faced as many children every day. Okay, thanks. Hi, my name is Renee McFarlane from Equal Education. Um, my first question is to Mpumi. I think the way that the waves correlate or the deaths of teachers correlate with the waves is very um, interesting, but I'm wondering if it's really helping us ask the question that we have, which is, if schools were open during the, those waves, would we have expected more deaths? Because I don't think we actually had schools open during any uh, waves, but that, I guess my question is, am I wrong? <laughs> and secondly, is there uh, any other research internationally that you know can help us answer that question? Um, and then my second question is to Martin. I'm wondering if he can say a little bit more about the potential theories around what resulted in such a massive metric cohort this year. I mean, it was noticeable, um, the increase in learners making it to metric and whether there isn't potentially a link with COVID. It seems kind of strange that it comes right after COVID. Is there potentially like learners were held back in grade 11 before or, or some explanation that like that that we could be thinking of? Thanks. Thanks. So maybe I can ask the panel to respond to that and then the next set of questions, prepare yourself. I think we have about six minutes left, right, for this session. So do you want to seven? <laughs> you want to start for me and then can um, why we were tracking the teacher mortality or excess death numbers was part of the argument we were having with the debate considerations were, are we seeing an increase in terms of teacher um, deaths because of school? So we measured that whole time when teachers were in school. And like I mentioned, there are some excess deaths that are related to COVID. But when we were seeing these spikes, these spikes were linked to general societal spikes and not to schools. And so it's not to say that schools had zero risk, but it also showed us that schools were not in fact the primary site of infection. We didn't present it here, but we also looked at NICD um, data around the relationship um, on who is the index case in terms of COVID-19 infections. And although at the start of the pandemic, we expected it to be children, it turns out children are often not the people who are spreading the virus. And again, mm -hmm. It was around balancing on um, reducing the risk. Where do we think infections are happening the most? And it wasn't in schools. Um, I'll share some reports that give you some international examples as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Yeah. Martin. Yeah. Yes. Can you hear me, Carol? Yeah. 
Yes, yes, the likely, the likely reason for the spurt in metric. Um, okay, so, um, but I, I think there's some, a couple of other questions I'd like to respond to as well. Penny's question around opportunities. Um, I, I, I don't think that without the pandemic, we would have paid this level of attention to the attendance data. So this data that's been sitting in databases, hardly used i think it's that that situation may have changed as a result of the pandemic we we will i think be in a better position to track attendance uh in future um on on the sharing of slides i mean the organizers should feel free to to I, I'd, I'd appreciate if the slides could be shared with everyone in the meeting um then uh yeah metric effects uh clearly this has to do with COVID. it's not unrelated to COVID. But we didn't expect COVID to have this effect, um, and uh, it's early to to to. I, I don't really want to speculate too much, but um, clearly there were different forms of or practices in promoting learners from one grade to the next, not just between grades eleven and twelve. Uh, partly because less information was available on the uh, competencies of learners. So they had to take some decisions in, 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 in the absence of data or, or with less data than, than they normally would. So I th definitely COVID had an impact, uh, but it's kind of in, 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 in an opposite direction and we need to understand that better. Uh, and what happens beyond this is, is, is very important. Are, are there lessons that can be learned in terms of how we promote learners from grades 11 to 12, because without a grade nine general education certificate, we really want as many youths as possible to get a matric certificate, even if it's a weak certificate, having that is better than having no qualification or certification at all. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask the other panel members to come in, but bef before I do that, I'd like to ask the provincial colleagues here what their sort of ideas about sort of why this, metric uh, this uh, extra extra set of uh, larger if you like than than expected cohort um, happened within their provinces kelly so i mean one one potential thing to support the idea about different promotion practices during COVID comes from the latest egrs one data where if you, you look at the percentage of repeaters in grade four in 2018 and repeaters in grade four in 2021, it's dropped substantially. So with the sort of instruction to remove assessments and promote learners, you, you see you clearly see that lower in the system. So that's that potentially is one. And then just to respond to the issue around opportunities, I think um, in the panel yesterday calling for standardized grade two assessment. But I think what this data has shown across now four different studies is the power, and obviously these are not nationally or provincially representative, but how important it is to have data at this uh, assessment data at this point of the system. So hopefully this gives impetus to pushing to collecting more of it. Thank you. And then I think there was a question on um, whether this has been fed into the catch up um, programs and work that's been happening there. I think there's a session later that will speak in more detail on that. But um, to say this is information that we keep sharing as we learn it. The latest one and a quarter year learning loss is one week old, but we have been speaking about it um, and trying to um, inform and, and support the colleagues about um, adapting. Uh, but maybe to remember, remember our catch up plan initially was going to be quite short. and. Over the um, pandemic, we've now extended it to multiple years, recognizing the depth of the learning losses that we have. So there is definitely a conversation there. Absolutely, thanks. Thank you, Ursula. On the metric, the size of the cohort, that was anticipated because of the changes in the the school-based assessment versus exam uh, ratio for um, for all the grades, actually. So you had much greater school-based school ass assessment counted for far more than exams. Um, and then the other thing, late in, um, in 2020, there was a special dispensation for 
students who missed the pro promotion, the, pro the progression requirement by 5% to be promoted. So that, and that would have affected uh, grade 11 and grade 12. So there was, it was anticipated because there was, there was a thought, the thinking that there would be much larger classes in those grades as a result. Thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, any areas that we should focus on now going, going forward in, in relation to research around A, these impacts, um, particularly on, on the early grade and particularly on early, early grade literacy? Any areas of focus now that we have this information, we've talked about the importance of data, we've talked about the importance of this analysis, but then going forward, um, what, what should we do? Are you going to respond to that? Um, I'm really interested in the, the data kind of suggests that very little learning happened at home. Um, and I'm interested to know with a lot of the programs we're actually set at trying to improve some learning at home and what does that tell us about what we need to do in, in the home space of, for learning? Yeah. yeah, I think just we, confirming the same, we had some parent surveys um, asking them what happened at home and some children's interviews asking them what happened at home. And I think a big takeaway for, for us, it's distinguishing the role of parents and teachers. They play very different roles. Parents are not teachers, largely, particularly if they're teaching you new skills like how to read. They can, as the uh, one of the keynote speakers spoke, could do exercises like read aloud. They can also supervise work that happens. But in terms of supervision, it means that the child would know what to do themselves. The teacher would have given try instructions, and then the home space is a protected time to do the work. But in terms of teaching them the basic skills, particularly when they're younger, that's not possible. Um, and we found in terms of even what resources parents had largely, the DBE workbook was the document or the resource that most parents said their children worked in. But aside from that, not much in terms of instruction was happening in the household for most children. Thanks very much. I mean, what clearly is coming from all the bits of data is just how important inequality is in, 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 the, in, in what we, we've experienced and what the impact has been. And the threat is for inequalities to widen and to continue to widen at a, at a, at a large, a very high rate. Um, and that's really something that has been confirmed, if you like, through the, the, all the bits of analysis. So that really is the, the, the sort of whole face of, 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 of literacy and education outcomes in the, in, the, in the coming year. There's another question and then we'll wrap up. I think we're over time. Um, my question is um, regarding grade four, to what extent is language uh, of instruction uh, seen as one of the contributors to learning losses, especially during COVID-19, when the children don't, uh, didn't have a teacher in front of them and having to, to study and learn the material that is there in English when there's no one to mediate the material in, 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 in the languages that they know? Sorry, in, in the online material that gets posted by various organizations also comes in English. So um, to what extent are we looking at language as, as one of the contributors? I mean, it has been before COVID, um, but I think we have been ignoring it um, because we think that children are coping from grade four when they only have to learn through the medium of English. Okay, so you're speaking a, a, a little bit more about sort of the availability of, of home language resources online, digitally, mm -hmm. amongst others. Okay. And those that are given to parents and children at home when they are in a rotational, um, uh, you know, situation. situation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the panel wants to get ready. I think we are got one more. Thanks. Thank you. I just wanted to add to Mpomi's response with regards to learning um, from home. Um, so in 2020, the DBE partnered with uh, various organizations um, to have to source um, video lessons. And uh, we, we focused on um, languages, we focused on 
mathematics, you know, just key subjects in the, in the early grades. And these video lessons were broadcast on the DBE Tzolopile channel. So we were trying to um, encourage, you know, learning to take place at home, especially when learners were, um, you know, on a rotational basis. So we understand that there were limitations, you know, in many households where you have, uh, you know, learners did not have access to, um, you know, a secluded space where they could study, sorry, not study, uh, you know, watch uh, the TV programs. But it was just one way of supporting our remote digital learning programs, you know, through TV. And we still continue with that program. Many of the lessons are being broadcast on the DB Itzolopila channel. And um, we, this year we are extending the remote digital learning to, um, you know, to radio broadcast lessons. Thanks. I think one of the things, the, 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 the issues that clearly came up uh, during the, the pandemic is, is actually the difference between supplying this and the use of it. And I think that's extremely, it, it really, really sort of was the difference between actually getting some benefit from it, um, not just having access to the physical infrastructure, remote and digital, but also being able to actually engage with it. And I think that's what uh, that question was about. Nick, last question, and then we... It's, it's more of a comment than a question. It was just on the last one about the Tuelo Pele channel. I think we must also just be realistic that if you've got 12 million children in the system and all of the grades, one channel is not going to be enough. You have less than 30 minutes of programming per grade for all of the subjects. And the same is true for radio. Uh, so access to online free websites or access to a television channel for 12 million people is not a catch-up strategy for the types of learning losses that we're seeing. It's completely inadequate. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from the panel before we? Kelly? Yeah. Last comments. Martin? Bumi? I think to Kelly's question around uh, English as a contributor, I think you, you've stated it well. The language of instruction question is an issue in general, um, even before the pandemic. But what we saw in our data was, in fact, the opposite, higher learning losses in home language and lower learning losses in EFAL in grade four specifically. And I think what we were saying is, you're right, that our assumption is that the language of instruction does interact with that. Um, there's less learning losses in English as we've measured them because learners are learning more English at that time. So they have a bigger input of English. Whether those learning losses would have been, um, they could have been the opposite if the language of learning and instruction was home language still in grade four. But I think your, your point around there's a language interaction uh, with learning loss in grade four is true. I think, I think one of the, the just uh, finally, uh, one, one of the things that's very clear is that we do have to, um, A, use the data and information that we have, but B, really look at uh, research on exactly what the, the, the experience, the learn, experience of learners is and the experience of learning um, uh, is in, in the system. Um, not necessarily what we, we offer, but how then that gets translated. And I think that's a key message that's coming from the presentations today, but also the presentation from yesterday. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much uh, for your engagement. I know that lunch yes. uh, looms. Yes. So, and thank you to the panel. Thank you, Martin, Kali.